Hello again. Thank you very much for joining me here on Movie Ninja. And tonight I'm going to be doing the Willow Episode 3 recap. I'm going to try to be a little bit more abbreviated compared to the first uh, two episodes that I did. Uh, but, but yes, so recap and then I'm going to share my thoughts just overall on the episode itself. So there will be spoilers, so just be aware of that. So this is episode... Three, the Battle of the Slaughtered Lamb. Now, the Battle of the Slaughtered Lamb, we have our party. Pretty much, it, it starts out, it hits the ground running. So, Alora Dan has been abducted by the, I'm going to call them the, the undead, the, the undead soldiers that are currently under the influence of one of the Gales. They have abducted her. The party goes after her, but with the interest of possibly also obtaining a very uh, special suit of armor, the Chimerian Curus. Uh, Borman and Kit uh, split off from the group for most of the episode. This episode is also highlighted by several skirmishes with, you know, Ballantine, who's one of the undead. I say undead because they have all of the uh, earmarks of, like, a revenant, like, you know, or a, a zombie sort of like a uh, servant character, you know, that you would have like in, in, in an RPG setting, things like that. So with that, we have several skirmishes throughout this episode. And we also, we still have some, some momentum with our characters. We learn a little bit more uh, about our characters. And now that this episode really puts the stakes out there for the party and the audience. Like, okay, now we're in the thick of it. You know, danger is not uh, a possibility on the horizon anymore. It is right there, right up in front of them. So uh, they have several uh, fights within this, uh, within this episode. And the episode culminates with some displays of magic from not just Delora Dannon, but also Willow, you know, and it climaxes in the Battle of the Slaughtered Lamb. So, like I said, there's a bit of back and forth. The main objective of this episode is to rescue Delora Dannon from her captors, or at least to head them off uh, before they're able to deliver Delora Dannon to the minions of the Chrome. So, with this, we learn a few things. We learn that, called it like Jade, who has been a uh, companion and sort of like a training partner with Kit for, they, they make it seem as if like, they never give an exact number in the show proper, but you can imagine it's been for several years. And of course, like, okay, the queen wanted Jade to be her training partner. And it's suggested. Like, I don't know why they just didn't come out and say it. Like, oh, by the way, take it easy on her. She's the princess. Okay, like, yeah, but Kit is crestfallen. She is surprised and just, like, more than just a little taken aback. They're like, what? I'm not super duper way better than you? At, like, you know, like at, at the knightly arts? No! Okay, like, and... Of course, Jade could never go full on, just like full contact, like with you. You're the princess, okay? Like to injure you, to scar you or anything like that. Okay, it's, one, it's a crime, not only that, but like, okay, even in the most basic aspects of just being someone who is a possible knight recruit, which in episode one, Jade was on her way to uh, to study, you know, knighthood with the Shining Brigade. So we know what her goals are. Yeah, like before all of this, like uh, the uh, the events of episodes one and two. Now, what we also find out is that there is some significant sort of like insecurity with Willow F. Good. Now we know we know that Willow is someone of high character, but something that the show 
didn't really display in the first two episodes are his true capabilities. Almost to the point where he's trying to lead us to kind of doubt his, his, his capabilities. What you have to understand, and they're like, I'm going to take a pause from the recap, from just sharing my thoughts and everything like that. Something that is unknown, I believe, to uh, probably a lot of the audience is really just the the hardship that Mr. Davis has to go through. Now, because of several medical problems that Mr. Davis has, he is in constant pain. Uh, particularly in uh, like in his hips as well as his legs. So, understandably, this performance that he's doing for the character Willow this time, a number of fans will understandably like notice that, well, he's not as energetic or dynamic as he was. First off, it's been over 30 years, so none of us are as energetic as we used to be, okay? But considering his problems... Which, like once again, they leave him in constant pain. And he has had, and he's been upfront about this. I'm not someone that has dug online for his medical records or anything. You know, he's been very upfront with uh, his, his struggles. He has had, like even, even as a younger person and even relatively recently in his adult years, he's had medical procedures to help alleviate some of the symptoms uh, unfortunately, it's just like, particularly with hip dysplasia, unfortunately, there's not much that can be done for that, even with surgery. So the character of Willow and Mr. Davis actually share certain, certain limitations. And I believe that Mr. Davis as an actor is actually utilizing those limitations to help with the portrayal of the role of Willow. So what do I mean by that? So, the insecurity that I was mentioning before is like, and you have a few scenes where he's off with Silas, you know, his companion from the village. And he's saying like, man, I just, aside from, you know, like sort of like doubting himself, like, is, is he a good mentor? Is he a good teacher to Alora Dan? And even before she was abducted, granted that it's been less than a week since she started lessons with him in magic. You know, like you can see that he doubts because of like it's so much time has gone by because of his because of his age. He's worried that he doesn't have the vigor to be their magical support like with this. He's, he's worried. He's legitimately worried that he will not be useful in this quest. And if that is the case. If he fails, he knows that these these people, these kids mostly, are gonna they're gonna perish, they're gonna die. And that is something that he significantly is concerned. Like he's his biggest fear has always come from himself. That he was not wise enough, that he was not strong enough, that he was not good enough even to learn magic to begin with. And that has been a tragic halo around him. For most of his life, we can we can see this, you know, because even if like now, it would be one thing if he was just like, man, I can't keep up with the young bucks anymore, you know, like, and that would be understandable because it's kind of like recognizing the limitations because of his age, but also, you know, the conditions of the actor I feel are informing the character. I and now this is going to be some assumption on my part, but I feel that, you know, drawing from his own concerns about perhaps, you know, how much longer he can be an actor, you know, without without significant health impact, you know. I I I think that that is a fear that Mr. Davis has and that is informing the character up to this point. And, you know, noticeably, uh, Mr. Davis has either, he's been, of course, like, you know, like a lot of fans responded to, oh, he has like, he has a wizard staff now. He's like a genuine wizard staff. Well, also that is, it's, it's, it's a walking cane, you know, it's, it's a walking cane and he has, he's more often than not in the scenes that he appears in, he is sitting 
versus like you know like any other type of like movement because y'all and i have several family members that unfortunately you know they struggle with chronic pain and aside from surgery if if you've had surgery and if surgery is an option and aside from maybe some reasonable medication you know there's been a lot of pullback like on that uh just for because uh, there's a lot of possibility of either over prescription or abuse of uh you know pain uh pain medication that sometimes you're just a prisoner of your own body you know if mr davis didn't love his career and he didn't he didn't love like i mean like i'm sure that he could have assigned if he if he if he wanted to you know if he had given his blessing to the fandom to producers and said hey i'm not sure i have it in me anymore you know but let's do a wide ranging cast call and we'll figure we'll figure out something you know i'm sh- i'm certain that he that he could have said that and a great deal of the fandom would have like you know the the reasonable ones the reasonable among us would say like okay you know because of his because of his needs you know he has made this decision and so we would you know respectfully you know not object but the thing is y'all like he you you know that and he could have done this much earlier in his career he could have said like it's too much you know it's it's not worth it and if he did that would have been completely his decision and he would have fashioned some other career elsewhere you know but to see how his character is influenced by what he himself has gone through you know i think i think it it works for the story and i think it's also a testament to the strength of mr davis uh as an as an actor as well so in my summary i mentioned that there's this climactic battle you know uh at a destroyed tavern tavern in called the slaughtered lamb and we now see you know like we have on screen we now see what willow is capable of and okay something to bear in mind from the film and raziel mentioned this to him is that there are certain types of spells or certain type of magic they're not just physically taxing like they're exhausting but they also cause pain now that is i i think that's actually very interesting and it's a very good idea i think because it makes mad, like it doesn't it's good limiter it doesn't provide magic users the option of being unlimited just like just casting spells one after the other and there's absolutely like zero consequence and if that was the case i think it would allow them to be a bit overpowered you know i i think like when there's no you know it's just like when you're sprinting you know you put strain on your muscles you put strain on your on your lungs and so that's why like you know that's why uh you know we have alternate means of transportation when we need to you know get from point a to point b in a short period of time because we can't run everywhere so i mean like i think when there are magic systems that have certain limiters like in play i like that i i i appreciate that from a story purpose um and it also works with you know what Mr. Davis's capabilities are as well. So when we see him use a very like when we see this grand display of his of his power because unfortunately the party suffers a loss. And it's something that Willow takes uh it, it take you know it pains him. So in this act of overflowing emotion ignites I believe like his his uh his spellcraft and we see this like this grand display. But in the same scene we also see it's so hard for Willow It's so hard for him to deal with the pain that he's feeling. 
And I feel that he used that Mr. Davis now, you know, the actor, character, not the same. But like I said, one is influencing the other, you know, for performance purposes. And it's hard for him to be at his friend's side, you know, and it, you can, you can see the struggle. And I believe that that struggle that we saw on screen, I believe it's real, you know, it's something that. In method acting, like use who you are to inform the character, and that's what I feel is is happening. And I think I think we're going to see a new fire out of Willow. I think you know because earlier in the episode, there's a few problems that come up, and people are saying, "Hey, Willow, you're supposed to be the sorcerer. Fix this with magic. Fix this with magic. Come on, come on, come on." And he said, "Like, no, I really everyone." understand i need to save my strength otherwise i might not be capable of protecting any of you or funding off the other fiendish minions of the crone i i I just it might not be possible you know and so we see when he exercises his power that there is you know that that it does tax him just like we saw in the film when he was trying to transmogrify Raziel from one of her animal forms into another form. Or when he was trying to conjure away. I say like conjure away. What I mean by that is like for people that are not particularly familiar with like D&D terms or fantasy terminology. He like teleport like in the very climax of the film Willow. He conjured Alora Dan and just out of sight. But he did it because we saw and we said, ah, you know, like he had the symptom of like, yes, he borrowed from his conjuring stage magic. And you, you, you can read it either way. It's like you can read it that Bav Morta didn't see him, you know, tuck the baby away, just sort of like off screen. Or you could take it like the way that I took it, that he used what magical ability he had to essentially accomplish a very... Uh, a, a very small type of like magic, but it was enough to at least buy time to think up another measure, you know, or at least throw Bav Morta off the long enough to take some other sort of like further action. Luckily, she just happened to touch the death altar at the wrong moment, and then bam, there like no more Bav Morta. Anyways, but like I, and you also see aside from like Willow and his struggles, you also see. Uh, like now, because we've seen the struggles and the limitations of uh, Kit and Borman and Elora Dannon. You know, Borman is still, I think, as much as he has his swagger, as much as he has his humor to make it seem like everything just like sort of brushes off of his back, we can see that he has regrets. You know, and um. There are also certain things that happen in the episode proper that make us sort of like question like where exactly is his is his dedication? Where is it leading? You know, I still think I still think he's one of the good guys. And I think he's like, you know, is going to square a debt with an old friend, a.k.a. Mad Mardigan, because he claims that he was a squire. But there have been a few sort of like red flags that have alerted the audience that maybe there's like, you know, Aside from maybe failing his master, squire, master, just the dynamic, um, and maybe that's why he was arrested. You know, it's pretty clear that he is very fast and loose with you know kingdom laws. You know, uh, so we get a little bit of information on him, but he does seem somewhat, perhaps, morally confused. We're not entirely sure if he's very self-servingly practical or if he is just someone who is playing a part in a much larger game that will eventually be to the benefit of all of the realms we don't know you know he is still somewhat like enigmatic but you can see that he does have some vulnerability probably a bit of regret too as far as like possibly even failing his former master man martigan but we'll see Kit had a huge blow to her ego at the very beginning when she found out that she's probably not as proficient in combat as she assumed that she was and was rather naive just assuming that like okay 
anybody who's gonna go spar with me is gonna give it their all. No, princess, they're not. Because you're royalty, they can't, okay? Average soldiers is like, yes, you know, like you spar to try and sharpen your skills. And so, you know, with full contact sparring, you, you need to have that intensity. You need to be able to see not only what you're capable of, but also working like with different techniques and try to improve from time to time. I think what it's actually going to come out is she's probably far, far less proficient than a lot of other combatants that probably will join the party like later on because I don't think she's had as much of an opportunity to grow as she thinks. She's imagined that she's an expert up until this point. And that's because probably not just Jade, but anybody who's been a part of her martial training has had to go easy on her because she's the princess. Duh. So, so there's that as well. Alora Dannon also, uh, she met two women in the woods while she was trying to flee from her captors. And one of them gave a very... She, she, she delivered a, a bit of a diatribe about how apparently there is kind of like a... I don't want to say cult, but there is a following of Alora Dannon because they saw, the, they saw the symbol, you know, like the, the, the mark. And apparently there is some sort of like following that Alora Dannon has that will immediately ensure that she has some type of backing. She will have some type of like following if she requests it of people. But she also see like, you know, like some people might say, well, automatic advantage, you know, like if there are people that already believe in me and, you know, will follow me like I'm their leader then th this will just work out fine. Like, you know, like we'll, we'll gain in numbers and in strength and we'll be able to fight the evil head on. But what she also sees is that, yes, people are willing to die for her, but, but, there's, a, but there's a burden to that as well. Because if those people are willing to fight for her and die for her, she understands that she may also be partially responsible for the deaths of anyone who decides to either join her in her mission or protect her. So, I mean, so there is that growth there as well. We also see that, you know, while she's resisting, uh, she touches the face of like one of these revenants and it does, it does damage to her. And that makes sense in like an RPG, typically, because they mention that she's the last blood of Chimeria, she's a high priestess. High priestess usually refers to clerics or holy mages or people that can use holy magic. So it seems like, like she does have lower tier holy magic at her, uh, at her use. She just hasn't been able to channel it or manipulate it as of yet. But we also see that she has that as a viable option in her arsenal as well. So, so there's that as well. Like, so we have some, some greater knowledge of, you know, what is going on with several of the characters. Graydon has also been able to sort of like vent his own personal insecurities and frustrations, you know. And I think that, I think he's trying. He is trying. So since we are headed into episode four, hopefully he will show a greater amount of growth. It has been like it has been confirmed that this season will be eight episodes long, and so we're, like this next week we're headed to, already to the halfway mark. So so yeah, but everything that happened in this—the abduction and the rescue of Alora Dannon, and certain discoveries that 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 were made as well—I feel like it's. Moved, I really did like the action. I like the pacing. Some of the things that I didn't like. Um. The color timing uh, was very hot, very hot or very cold. So if it wasn't desaturated, uh, it was, I think it was oversaturated. And I wasn't entirely sure why that is. They did mention that they were heading into the realm where the crone has a lot more influence. And so, yeah, and you've seen this in a lot of like fantasy films like Underworld or the later Harry Potter movies where to showcase that there's a sort of 
atmos like there's a grim atmosphere or like a malaise in the presence of like you know like uh, these this this like evil or supernatural like forces. The, the directors wash things out. And admittedly, I, I don't I don't care for that myself. It's very distracting. But the the other end is distracting as well. Like to make it like super bright or like oversaturated, like that sort of like Zack Snyder sort of like feel that that he sometimes does, almost makes things far too radiant. Which is just it's weird. Um, the whole episode like wasn't like that. But I think perhaps the director of photography was probably trying to convey both a sense of dread as well as the prospect of hope. Uh, either, you know, like, because really the oversaturation was just for like about one scene. So, so maybe that's what they had in mind there. It's just like a, to a sort of like uh, a tonal cue, which I could see that. I just wish it hadn't been like that extreme. But aside from that, oh, by the way, Kit's still insufferable. <laughs> I'm not going to hide that assessment of the character in that way. The episode starts out with Borman telling her or trying to convey information about the Chimerian Curus, you know, this, uh, this magical armor that may give someone in their party an edge, like later on down the road. And she interrupts his story with like, oh man, you olds are so boring. Jeez. Like, just, just speed it up, Boomer. I mean, Borman, God, come on. Like, whoever was responsible for the writing of this character, yes, we get it. She's spoiled. She's privileged. Let's, let's ease it back just a little bit. Getting into the latter half of the, of the show, please, okay? So, so, yeah. But aside from that, I, like I said, I like the energy of this episode. And I also like to see, like, now we have a bit of a more concrete understanding, like, where where we're going with this. So, and once again, another cliffhanger ending is like, okay, the only place that we have available, the only place is like, okay. And this is going to be, like, episode four is definitely going to have movie callbacks. Movie callbacks galore because, y'all, we are headed to Knockmore Castle, you know, and understandably... It's been a while. If you don't know what that means, well, that was Queen Bav Morda's HQ in the original film. So, like, so there we are. But that's the, that's the only place we, we need some shelter, you know, uh, for 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 various other purposes in the next episode. That's all, that's 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 all we got. All we got is the Ramada Inn, guys. The Ramada Inn. I'm sorry, we got. That's it. But anyway, it was like I was like, you know, and it and yes, it's haunted and it has structural issues and they've had nothing but failing grades from the Better Business Bureau. But you know what? But that's, that's all we got. That's it. Um, but yeah, it's probably going to be a bit more sort of like uh, like we're going to get like nostalgia bombed uh, next episode. Ah, but that's fine. I don't mind. I I, I still like the show. Uh, I and I'm I'm glad to see like where this is headed. Because, like, now I feel that, like, we're halfway into it. So we're going to get... We should be getting towards more of the rising action of the season climax, like, now. Like, so things should be probably, like, moving uh, much quicker. And, you know, there's not so much of a build-up towards, like, events happening. So, anyways. So that's my uh, recap and my thoughts on Willow Episode 3. Thank you guys so much for joining me here on Movie Ninja. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.